Tonight. I had this pain in my back. I lost my breath. I couldn't breathe right. She was found to have a colorectal cancer. An ABC 27 special presentation. One day I woke up, went to the potty, and there was blood in the potty, and it didn't go away. Penn State Hershey Colon and Rectal Surgery presents Colorectal Diseases, Expert Surgical Solutions, brought to you by Penn State Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. Good evening, I'm Chuck Rhodes. There are medical subjects many people prefer not to talk about. Hemorrhoids, diverticulitis, ulcerative colitis, and colon cancer, but tonight we're talking about it here as part of Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. Although more and more people are now screened for colorectal cancer in the United States, it's still the third most common cancer for both men and women. The American Cancer Society estimates there will be over 130,000 cases of colorectal cancer in 2015. 70% are colon cancer and 30% are rectal cancer. According to Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America, there are approximately 1.6 million people living with inflammatory bowel disease. Ulcerative colitis affects nearly 700,000 Americans. Now to Thanks, Chuck. A Dauphin County woman went to the emergency room because of severe pain in her chest, a pain that she is thankful for today. I love that it tells a story. It's just fun to look back and look at my books. Marcy Baker measures, cuts, and attaches pictures of some unforgettable moments of her life. I scrapbooked this journey, so it's pages from that. I figure someday I need to finish this book, so today, today can be one step closer to that. Marcy designs a page that retraces the steps she took three years ago. The journey begins at her son's basketball game. I had this pain in my back, and it would come and go. And we got home that night, and it was making dinner. We had friends over, and. Um, it started traveling around to the front into my chest around my rib cage and it just progressively got worse and I, I lost my breath, I couldn't breathe right. I get a phone call and I don't think it was, no, it was our friends called us said we're on the way to take Marcy to the hospital. I was like, what? You know, and she says she's in that much pain, she's doubled over. You know, chest pain, a whole nine yards. Fortunately, they ruled out a heart attack right away, but the pain just continued to get it, more pain than I've ever felt in my life. And they admitted me to the hospital that night, and I spent a week there. Marcy was diagnosed with pancreatitis, and more specifically, gallstone pancreatitis, meaning that a gallstone left her gallbladder, traveled through the bile ducts, through the biliary tree, and obstructed the pancreas, and then obstruction of the pancreas causes inflammation of the pancreas. But the mainstay of treatment is GI rest, meaning nothing to eat or drink for a few days, and then advancing through liquids and a light diet until the inflammation resolves. Once that happened, the gallbladder needed to be removed. I had a big grand plan because this was going to be done laparoscopically and I said I would like you to do it the day before Good Friday because I will have off school Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday and I can go back to school on Tuesday. We reviewed her records and on two CT scans noted the strange finding of some thickening of the colon which, is, uh, which was a bit unusual and that alerted us to recommend that she have that examined with a colonoscopy prior to proceeding with the gallbladder surgery. He said, I would be very negligent if I didn't look at this first or have somebody look at it. He said, so I want to set you up for a colonoscopy beforehand. We're going to get it looked at so we can go in and we can know that everything is OK. And uh, turns out it was. <laughs> Sorry. Turns out it wasn't OK. So emotional for Marcy. Her grand plan had to be detoured. Now she had to see a colorectal surgeon. What you see is here's the rectum and here's the sigmoid colon. And it's this area here where the sigmoid colon and the rectum meet where we see a thickening of the wall of the colon. That thickening of the wall is a subtle finding but gave us a suspicion that there might be a cancer located here. Pathology reports confirmed Marcy's worst fear. 
she was found to have a colorectal cancer. And so now all of a sudden, instead of just having a gallbladder problem, you know, poor Marcy was saddled with this other problem, which in many respects was even more scary than the original problem that brought all of this to discovery. I was a mess, but I do remember the worst question I think anybody's ever asked me. Is my youngest son same mommy, are you gonna die? <laughs> And to have to look at your child and say, I don't know. I'm an optimistic guy. It's like, I think, you know, everything's going to be okay. We'll work through this. God's here for us. He will make this good. He's not done with you yet, you know. And then what uh, Dr. Halleck and I had to do was to coordinate our respective surgeries. We wanted, for convenience's sake, to perform a combined, in this case, a single incision laparoscopic surgery. So we made one and only one incision in Marcy's abdomen. Uh, once that was all created and established, I went ahead and removed uh, her gallbladder, which was very straightforward, about 20 minutes. And then once that was done, Dr. Stewart proceeded with the colectomy portion of the operation. And then I was able to go in and to remove that part of Marcy's intestine where the cancer was located, and then to connect her colon and rectum back together. He told us right away when he asked, he said the surgery went great, it's just, she's not going to be happy. I felt for safety reasons that it would be best to give her a temporary ileostomy. And that was predicated on the fact that her particular surgery was not all that easy. It's not something that anybody wants, but if it's going to save your life, then you have to suck it up. You just have to accept it. In the meantime, Marcy received some news that made everything right. I got her pathology report back and I wanted to share with her the good news that we got all of the cancers, she wouldn't need chemotherapy. I was very fortunate and very lucky. I was really blessed that that's all that it was. I mean, as scary as it was, it was gonna be okay. At that point, it was just, let's recover. That was great news. What a huge plus to not have to go through that. A blessing. Four months later, Dr. Stewart performed another surgery to reverse the ileostomy. As Marcy finishes another page in this journey to unchartered territory, she's thankful it was a place she visited for a short time. To this day, I still say it was the greatest, most painful blessing I've ever had in my life. If it wouldn't have happened, who knows when we would have found it. It's just one of the blips that we've had, and we keep, keep faith, keep going. I'm two and a half years out, so I have two and a half more years to go before I'm considered really cancer-free, but I'll take that for now. It's a gift every day. And Marcy truly feels that way. Now she has blood work every six months and a colonoscopy every year. So far, the reports have been clean. Chuck, back to you. That's good news. Thank you, Deborah. Now joining us on the set is Marcy's doctor, David Stewart. Uh, doctor, we saw in that report that she had no signs or symptoms for this colon cancer. Is this common, no you know, signs? That's correct. Marcy had no symptoms of colon or rectal cancer. It was discovered incidentally on a CT. Unfortunately, that's a very common phenomenon. All right, if somebody suspects they have colon cancer, they're concerned about it, what, what are some of the signs and symptoms they should be watching for? Well, usually the most common symptom is abdominal pain, and that's followed by changes to a person's regular bowel habits. Um, that would include the new onset of diarrhea or constipation. And then rectal bleeding is something else that requires evaluation. And we noticed in there she did not need chemotherapy or radiation. How do you decide when that surgery is the answer? Right, so colon and rectal cancers are cured by surgery, but sometimes in an effort to you know, further solidify that cure, we do need chemotherapy after surgery. That's based upon a review of the patient's pathology. We talked earlier and you mentioned that Colon cancer is very preventable. Now that jumps out off the page at me. What, what do we mean by that? So one of the reasons we emphasize screening colonoscopies is that cancers usually don't just spring up out of the blue, but they start off as polyps. If we can find and remove the polyps, we prevent the formation of cancers. Is there an age or uh, 
a time somebody should get a colonoscopy? Is there a, a set procedure you go through or just one by one? There is. So for an average risk person, somebody who's not having symptoms and has no blood relatives who have colon or rectal cancer, we would say beginning screening at age 50 is when they would want to, uh, to do that. Okay. Well, thank you, doctor, for joining us here tonight. And we're going to check back with Deborah over in the call center. Thank you, Deborah. Thanks, Chuck. The phone lines are busy. Yeah. Once again, the number to get through is 717-346-3333. And these phone lines will be open until 8 o'clock tonight. Now, here to answer our viewer questions is colorectal surgeon Dr. Kevin McKenna. Thanks for being with us. My pleasure. This is our first viewer question. I'm 46 years old and occasionally have blood in my stool. Also, after going to the bathroom, I always feel like I still have to go. Should I have a colonoscopy? Absolutely. Uh, any blood per rectum, whether on the stool, in the stool, or even separate from the stool, is abnormal and should be investigated. You know, over the past 20 years, I've had a number of patients who noticed some blood on the toilet tissue, attributed this to hemorrhoids, and were subsequently diagnosed with much more serious problems, uh, including colon and rectal cancer. So yes, I would strongly urge your viewer to contact his primary care provider and uh, have a colonoscopy arranged. Okay, thanks, Dr. McKenna. If the Welcome back. A Lebanon County man was enjoying an active lifestyle that including taking hunting trips to running 5K events. All of that stopped when he went to the bathroom one day. He measures from nose to, to tail. It's five, six or five, seven. And he weighed 225 pounds. Willie Bixler spotted this bear in Montana three years ago. And I know the bear saw us. The whole idea was to get into range. I shot him at, I think it was 10 yards. It was a pretty big thrill, it really was. This was Willie's biggest accomplishment in his 40 plus years of archery hunting. A love of his, he had to give up because of his health. One day I woke up, went to the potty, and there was blood in the potty. And it didn't go away. I just remember him being in the bathroom a lot, and when he had to go to the bathroom, it was urgent that he had to find a bathroom right away. The frequency of going to the bathroom increased, and the urgency increased. So it was not quite as bad as diarrhea, but it was almost a two, I could go to the bathroom 14 times a day, and a maximum, I have 10 minutes to get there. He was also very tired, which is not like him. Even during the day, he was sleeping maybe a couple hours during the day. I went to my family doctor. He said, it's eight years since you had a colonoscopy. I'm gonna send you to the GI doc. His colonoscopy showed that he had persistent inflammation. Most of his inflammation was on the left side of his colon. It may not be fully appreciated, but you can see that it's relatively red in areas, that this looks kind of swollen and boggy. These folds here should be thin, almost knife-like in their appearance, and that's the classic presentation, the typical appearance for ulcerative colitis. We'll start out with a variety of treatments. We're gonna go from prednisone, which is the first stage, cheap drug, works for a lot of people, and then if I do well, I do well, and if not, we'll go in progressive stages to more potent drugs and we'll end up biologic drugs. When he was on the medicines, um, some of them did not help, so then they would be changed. I could go to the bathroom and 10, 15 minutes later, I gotta go again. Then I could go for hours and be okay or I could go in another 10 or 15 minutes. So the fear of the unknown kept me pretty close to home. So Willie's active lifestyle became non-existent. In fact, Willie had to cancel a hunting trip to Montana because of the ulcerative colitis. Willie really likes hunting. That's one of the top things in his life that he enjoys doing. So that was really working on him that he could not get out and hunt like he was accustomed to hunting. That was a little inconvenient. I didn't want to be going to the potty out in the mountains. So it's one of the things I gave up for two years. During that time, the medicine stopped working, so Willie had to try another form of treatment, biologic therapies. Biologic therapies refer to the fact that these medications have specific targets in the immune system, in the biological happenings of the 
human's immune system. So about six to nine months, I'm living with this. It's a, a home injection deal, it's no big deal. It's something expensive. And going back to the GI doc again, said, he says, can you live like this? I said, no, I'm still afraid to go anywhere. It was not helping him as much. It got rid of the blood that he was passing, but he still was going to the bathroom 15, 16 times a day. And so surgery as an option was getting more and more prominent in his mind. So I'm really, I live with what I have or I get the operation. It was a tough decision for him to make and I could tell when I was sitting in the hospital room with him in the morning before the surgery, he was very nervous about the surgery. Oh, I was definitely anxious. I, the only other surgery I ever had, I had torn cartilage in my knee. So I never had anything major like this. But uh, I'm a faithful guy and I had faith that I would come through all this. Uh, what we do is we take out the colon in its entirety and we use the remaining intestine called the small bowel which is healthy to create a new reservoir, a new pouch of sorts. And we attach that to the anus. And so the patient now has a sort of a new colon, a new mini colon that can store stool and they can go to the bathroom in the usual fashion. Willie spent nine days in the hospital. Within a couple of months, he was active again. It gets better all the time. More strength, more energy, less trips to the bathroom. He actually can do some of the things that he really likes to do because he's not wondering when his next trip to the bathroom is going to be. One of the family traditions is we run the Sticks and Biscuits 5K on Thanksgiving Day. Normally I'd run that at 27 something. It's a social event. I did run it this year being out two months and uh, it was more like 33, 34 minutes. But I ran it and now I think I could run it in 30 and I'm sure I'll be back to where I should be till this Thanksgiving. Remember the hunting trip Willie had to cancel? Well, he plans to go to Montana this fall and hunt with his son. Chuck? Thank you, Deborah. Now, Willie's surgeon, Dr. Walter Colton, joins us. Doctor, we talked earlier out there. Willie's symptoms seem to come on awfully quickly. We know what causes the ulcerative colitis. Is there a set cause for this? Well, nobody really knows what causes ulcerative colitis or inflammatory bowel disease in general. But like many diseases, there's a genetic component, there's a susceptibility, in other words, of the patient to the disease, as well as there's probably some sort of environmental trigger. And when the correct environmental trigger combines with the patient who has the susceptibility to the disease, uh, they get the disease. Now, the environmental trigger may be different for different people because they have different genetic uh, susceptibility to the disease. So we haven't found the specific cause of the disease, but we do know that genetics plays a big role. Is there a specific age where people develop this uh, ulcerative colitis? Yeah, the most common um, ages to develop this disease, unfortunately, is relatively young. Hmm. Most people are 20 to 40 years old, hmm. um, you know, at a period in their lives when they're starting families, getting a new job, trying to build their careers. It's unfortunate that this disease, which is quite disabling, strikes at uh, such a relatively youthful age. Is colon surgery the only solution for ulcerative colitis? No, as uh, Willie stated, he was placed on uh, numerous different medications. And in fact, medications treat uh, the majority of patients with ulcerative colitis. Um, probably around 70 to 80% of patients can be effectively managed with medications. But then there's another group of about 20 or 30% of patients who have really severe disease or they don't respond to the medications or not infrequently they have bad side effects to the medications and then they go to surgery and surgery um, as you see with Willie um, has the unique advantage you might say of being able to cure the patient. The patient who's medically managed uh, frequently will have to be on those medicines for a long time mm. usually the rest of their life. Patients who go through surgery they're effectively cured when their colon comes out. Okay thank you and that's going to be it for right here right now we're going to go back over to the call center it's awfully busy over there Deborah. It is Chuck. We're going to go right to our viewer question right now with Dr. McKenna. Here's the question. Are colitis and ulcerative colitis the same thing? So colitis is a very general term that we use to describe inflammation in the lining of the colon. And it can be caused by a variety of different conditions. Ulcerative colitis is a very specific disorder. It's an inflammatory bowel disease, which typically can be treated medically, but occasionally does require surgery to treat it. Okay. Does a poor diet increase your risk for colorectal cancer? 
I think that's a great question because what it does is it allows us to focus on some of the modifiable lifestyle factors, uh, particularly with respect to diet. So there is research that suggests that diets that are high in red meats and processed meats uh, do increase risk of developing colorectal cancer, while diets high in fiber, vegetables, and fruits may decrease the risk. Okay, Dr. McKenna, thank you tonight for answering our viewer questions. And we also want to thank the specialists here. Once again, they've been very busy. You can call. The lines are open until 8 o'clock this evening. Chuck, we'll send it back to you. Thank you, Deborah. And Dr. Colton, now both our patients tonight required surgery. What makes the colorectal surgery program at Penn State Hershey different? Well, first of all, um, possibly somewhat surprisingly to your audience, uh, our uh, colorectal surgery program is one of the largest in the state. It's been around for about 20 years and there's really nothing at um, Hershey Medical Center uh, that um, is anything less than world class. We've been uh, recognized as being outstanding. In fact, the term is exemplary in our care of patients. Only five hospitals in the United States received such an exemplary rating for colorectal cancer care. In addition, uh, we do quite a bit of research in colorectal um, diseases. We have a very strong genetics group that looks at the genetic basis of disease and that doesn't just apply to ulcerative colitis or colorectal cancer, it also applies to other diseases such as diverticulitis and other uh, colorectal diseases. Now the double surgery was done at the same time using one incision. Is minimally invasive surgery, is that becoming more common? Minimally invasive surgery, or some people call it keyhole surgery, is very common. Uh, for patients who need major abdominal surgery at Hershey Medical Center, about 45 to 50 percent of our patients have it done either with a minimally invasive or a keyhole technique or using robots, yes. Talk about the research that's going on. Is there anything in the works right now that maybe change the way we treat these diseases in the future? Yeah, I think the two main uh, areas that uh, uh, are going to affect how we treat diseases, one is probably technical because surgery is a technical craft, and that is really the minimally invasive techniques that we're using these days, and the robot is becoming ever more increasingly used, and there's certain advantages to making the incision smaller, less stress for the patient. That's one thing. The second thing is this genetic aspect of disease management. Um, a lot of diseases now are managed uh, from a genetic perspective, especially cancers, and that includes colorectal cancer, but uh, it also will be used to treat patients uh, for other diseases so that surgical decision making, not just medical decision making, but surgical decisions, how we treat patients from a surgical perspective, will in part be decided by looking at a patient's genetics. And this is called personalized medicine, and what it does is it recognizes that each patient is individually different, even though they seem to have the same disease, the disease in that person is a little bit different and that person deserves specialized, personalized care. That usually is based on genetic evaluation, which is an area of research that's uh, uh, very paramount at uh, Hershey Medical Center. Well, thank you, Dr. Colton, for joining us again tonight. You've been here every year helping us out. We appreciate that. Sounds like a lot's being done. We also want to thank you, our viewers, for sharing your stories and sending in those questions. We'd like, if you'd like more information or you'd like to schedule an appointment with Penn State Hershey Colon and Rectal Surgery, just call 717-531-5164 or you can visit online at pennstatehershey.org slash colorectal.